be very yeah, happy. So I invite uh, Dr. Yogal to chair I'm, this session. I'm going to introduce. I'm going to introduce. Just a second, yeah. Uh, so uh, coming to the last talk, I know you're all very hungry, so I'll only take about 10 minutes. I'll be talking on uh, newer therapies in the treatment of systolic heart failure. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Yogal sir to kindly chair this session. So I'll probably take no more than 10 minutes to talk about this, and after this we can uh, uh, have lunch. So what I'll be discussing, I know there's been a lot of uh, echo talk. This is just going to be a brief uh, clinical talk. Uh, I'll be talking about newer therapies in systolic heart failure. Now this is not anything new. I'm sure all of you are aware of what treatments are given for patients who have heart failure. But to just give you a brief introduction, heart failure is a, well, it's a fatal, well, it is a fatal condition where only about 50% of patients are alive uh, five years after the diagnosis has been made. It is a major public health concern, affects over 23 million people across the globe with high hospitalization rates and cost of care. The goal of treatment, uh, there are multiple goals that we look at. Uh, one is the, we want to improve the patient's clinical status, looking at improving their functional capacity, quality of life, trying to reduce hospital admissions and to reduce mortality. So this is what all the treatment that we give for in uh, heart failure is aimed towards. Currently, I'm only talking about medical therapy. I won't be talking about device therapy. Um, we are currently prescribing ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, uh, MRAs, that is mineral cortical aldosterone receptor antagonists, digoxin and diuretics as part of the therapeutic uh, strategies. Um, just one slide about each of them. ACE inhibitors have been shown to reduce mortality and morbidity in patients with heart failure with reduced injection fraction. And they have to be up titrated. Clinical trials have looked at uh, up titrating these doses, so you have to make sure that you try and reach the maximal achievable dose and get adequate inhibition of the RAS system. Uh, and also make note that you have to use ACE inhibitors in patients with asymptomatic left ventricular dysfunction to reduce the risk of heart failure development, hospitalization, and death. So ACE inhibitors are extremely important. Beta blockers as well, uh, reduce morbidity and mortality uh, despite um, a treatment with uh, ACE inhibitors and in most cases a diuretic. Uh, their use is complementary with an ACE inhibitor, so make sure that you start a beta blocker as soon as possible. Again, it's all about starting at a low dose and up titrating the dose uh, gradually. Um, and in those with heart failure or acute heart failure, you may want to wait a little while before introducing a beta blocker. Particularly, you need to consider them if you have heart failure with atrial fibrillation. <coughs> then we move on to uh, mineral corticoid and aldosterone receptor antagonists. Again, spironolactone and epilerinone block the receptors that bind to aldosterone and with different degrees and affinity to other steroid hormones. And they are recommended for all symptomatic patients despite therapy with an ACE inhibitor or beta blocker with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and an EF of less than 35%. Again, it is to reduce mortality and to reduce hospitalizations. But always be careful and monitor their uh, creatinine and their potassium values, especially potassium values, and consider uh, choosing an alternate medication if their potassium levels are elevated. Diuretics, of course, are uh, recommended to reduce the signs and symptoms of heart failure, but don't really have any strong mortality and morbidity um, data. Loop diuretics are used more frequently than thiazide diuretics. Um, obviously, the effect that we get with them is better. Um, the aim of diuretic therapy is to try and maintain euvolemia. And you may want to stop uh, long-term diuretics if your patient is maintained in the euvolemic state or if they achieve some degree of hypovolemia. What I'll be primarily talking about in newer therapies is um, the angiotensin receptor neutralizing inhibitors. This has been around since... Uh, for the last five years, and a bit less than that, actually four years or so, 2014 was the, the study that was published. Now, currently we know that blockade of uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, system is the cornerstone in the treatment of heart failure. But when you add in uh, inhibition of neptralizin, the benefits that you reach uh, or achieve are a lot more. So what happens in heart failure is there's an increase in the number of the natriuretic peptides. And what neptralizin normally does is it breaks down these peptides. These peptides are actually helpful in, when it comes to managing heart failure. And I'm talking about the NPs, not the pro-BNPs, uh, just the normal NPs. So ANP, BNP, and CNP. So in 2015, July, the FDA approved uh, Sacubitril and Valsartan, which was previously known as LCZ696 for patients who had chronic and stable but symptomatic heart failure and who had a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 40%. Um, they did recommend using the drugs in conjunction with other heart failure therapies, but in place of ACE inhibitors and or ARBs, uh, and it is contraindicated in patients who have history of angioedema. 
So this is the mechanism of action that was published in the paper. As you can see, there are uh, two main uh, mechanisms involved. Um, one is the, the RAS system over here and one is the NP system. Um, what happens is nephrolysin breaks down the natriuretic peptide, so it can cause all the opposite effects to this. So if you block it, what can happen is you can get uh, reduced fibrosis, reduced hypertrophy, better natriuresis and diuresis, um, and uh, slightly redu reduced blood pressure. And if you block, obviously, the angiotensin uh, system, uh, you get, again, the same sort of effects. This is the actual effect of the angiotensin system uh, in, is in a harmful way. <coughs> So the, briefly to talk about the paradigm heart failure study, this was the landmark study that was published uh, uh, about four years ago in the New England Journal. Uh, it compared uh, a maximum dose of uh, 200 milligrams twice daily or a total of 400 milligrams of LCZ696 versus enalapril. Enalapril was chosen because most of the data looking at heart failure looks at enalapril. There are some studies looking at ramipril as well, but mostly enalapril was the landmark study. The SOLVE trial looked at uh, enalapril. So what they did was they had patients who were already on existing ACE inhibitor therapy for at least four weeks and those who had uh, uh, symptomatic heart failure. So they were in NOHA class 2 to 4. They had a reduced ejection fraction of 40% and a BNP of more than 150 or an NT pro BNP of more than 600. This depended, of course, if they were on uh, hospitalized, whether the BNP values changed a little bit. They looked at uh, giving patients or randomizing them to LCZ 200 BD and uh, enalapril 10 milligrams BD. And what they eventually wanted to study was the all-cause mortality, uh, renal progression, which is very important, and clinical summary score. They looked at something called the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, which is sometimes used in evaluating uh, symptoms of patients. So what they did was they started off with about a run-in period. And uh, the run-in period, they wanted to make sure that patients were able to tolerate the doses or that they were going to give before randomizing them. So they gave them about one to two weeks of enalapril. These were patients already on treatment. So if they were on, already on a different ACE inhibitor, they were shifted over to enalapril uh, and tightened it up to 10 milligrams PD. This was actually continued for a period of four weeks. And then they moved uh, them on to LCZ 100 milligram BD and 200 milligram BD. And this was to make sure that there was no cross reaction. And one particular point that is made very clear is that the transition from enalapril to LCZ was done after stopping the ACE inhibitor for 36 hours. And this is because there's a risk of angioedema if you give this. So that is very important even in clinical practice that you stop your ACE inhibitor first for 36 hours, allow the washout of the ACE inhibitor, and then move on to uh, LCZ696. Once the run-in period was done, they double-blinded uh, double blinded them to LCZ200 milligram BD and uh, enalapril 10 milligram BD. And they followed them up for a period of 30 to 32 months. And the re results were quite remarkable. They found that the primary composite outcomes looking at death from all cardiovascular causes were reduced by 20%. And if you look at the heart failure hospitalizations as well, it's around 21%. Similarly, the death uh, from any cause was about 16% reduction. And all of these reductions were significant. The p-values were remarkable, 0 0.0009. So these are the sort of values that we got, or they got, sorry. Um, the other things that they looked at was uh, improvement of quality of life. Uh, they looked at patients uh, surviving at uh, four months, eight months, and at uh, 12 months. And in all groups, uh, they looked at quality of life by looking at the KCCQ score that I mentioned earlier. And they found that there was a significant improvement in all the quality of life scores at early on uh, with treatment with uh, sacubitril and valsartan combination. They also looked at NYHA class, um, the lower proportion of uh, heart failure patients receiving this uh, medication were considered by this, their physicians to have a worsening of NYHA class. So the paper patients actually did a lot better. Again, they looked at 4, 8, and 12 months. And as you can see, there was a significant change between all of them. <coughs> the other thing that they looked at is non-fatal clinical deterioration. So they're looking at outpatient therapy intensification, emergency department visits for heart failure, hospitalization for heart failure, and the requirement for uh, intravenous inotropic medication, and also the re need for CRP and ICD in one implantation, sorry, VAD uh, implantation in heart, uh, heart transplant. And again, in all cases, except in the last one, there was a significant reduction in the requirement for all this, though in this one, uh, it was trending towards a reduced requirement for CRTD, though it is not significant. One concern always with the use of uh, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and even this uh, sacubitril valsartan is hypotension. While there was a, about 3 mm more drop in the, this group, or the LCZ group, uh, they didn't really consider, it wasn't really significant, uh, the difference between the enalapril alone and the, um, 
the LCZ the 1696 group. Once again, angioedema is a big concern. Um, there was more, slightly more reported cases of medication requirement for angioedema in the LCZ group, but again, it was not a significant difference. So amongst these 4,000 or so patients, only 16 of them actually had angioedema, where only nine had it with enalapril. Again, looking at symptomatic hypotension, increase in the potassium, increase in creatinine, etc., there was no significant uh, difference between the two groups, and neither was there any discontinuation of the drug for um, any adverse event. So the patients actually stuck on the therapy. The compliance is actually quite good. Uh, this is the same thing uh, that I pulled from the journal. Just briefly, a couple of slides of Ivabradin. Ivabradin, as we know, is an IF uh, channel blocker. It uh, lowers heart rate by inhibiting a specific sinus node pacemaker uh, without affecting myocardial contractility or relaxation. And the trial that looked at heart failure was the SHIFT trial. Uh, it looked at about 6,500 plus patients with stable symptomatic heart failure and LV ejection fraction of below 35% and those who are in sinus rhythm because, as you know, Ivabradin can't be given if there's atrial fibrillation. And they also looked at a heart rate of at least 70 beats per minute because the studies have found that keeping a heart rate above that has a, a poorer prognosis. Um, so they reduced the trial, Ivabradin significantly reduced the primary endpoint of uh, cardiovascular death in hospital admissions. Um, and it also found that by reducing the heart rate, the patients did a lot, lot better. The only problem with this study was that not all the patients who were on this uh, in this study were on target dose of beta blockers. Uh, so this is when you should consider it, when there's an ejection fraction less than 35%, if the patient is in sinus rhythm and if the heart rate is above 70, uh, despite uh, maximal dose or evidence-based dose of uh, beta blockers or the maximum tolerated dose of beta blockers. And it should be considered in uh, the above indication if the patient is intolerant to beta blockers. So this is the last slide. Just to conclude, the heart failure therapies have advanced beyond standard therapies over the years. Uh, Sacrovital valsartan therapy has resulted in a paradigm shift which keeps within with the trial name in outcomes of patients. And fortunately, side effect profiles are minimal and the results are promising. And with that, I conclude my talk and today's meeting. Um, <laughs> sir, any comments? Thank you, Dr. Malaya. I'm sure uh, most of the cardiologists sitting here have used all these drugs. Arnie is a new drug, actually. Um, some of the points which we should remember is actually you stressed upon that when most of the time cardiac failure are already giving ACE inhibitors, when you are switching on to this particular type of ARBS, at least 36 hours gap should be there. Similarly, if they don't tolerate this drug again, if you want to come back to ACE inhibitors, again there should be a gap of 36 hours. Yeah. That's one thing. Should not be given to pregnant women about the information about the lactating mother we don't have. And if you are using this RA group of drugs, particularly in young ladies, who are likely to go for pregnancy, one should be careful to stop the drug at that level. Yeah. Yes, sir. And about the other drug, the ivabradin is another useful drug. When beta blockers cannot be used, ivabradin has helped us to reduce the heart rate and this one. As far as improvement in the LV function is considered, although a number of studies are there, but uh, I do not know the experience of others. Uh, my patients yeah. have shown improvement uh, symptomatically, but at the end of four months, one patient showed the EF from 35 to 41. Mm. They tell at least four to six months minimum should be yes. given, then only will be knowing the results. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? The speaker will be interested to and so we'll hand over the mic to the organizers for conclusion. Uh, all the um, senior consultants and my mentors and all of you in the audience, um, uh, particularly to Professor Vijay Raghavan sir for making it all the way from Kerala and I'd also like to thank my friend my dear friend from college, Dr. Prem as well, who has made it from Mangalore to do the talk, and all of you for attending on a Sunday morning. Um, as is again, um, I won't take too much of your time. Um, I would like to again stress uh, the point that I'd like, if, if it's okay, for all of you, I encourage you to become members of the Indian Academy of ECHO. Dr. Govind has already asked you, informed you about the journal as well, so that journal will be forwarded to you through email. Every time it is published, we'll be sending it out through email. So if you haven't received the email or you feel that you're not given us email address or anything, kindly leave it at the desk. Uh, there's a register at the front, and I'll enter it in our database just to make sure all of you get the emails. And again, anybody with a Gmail account, these account, these emails are sort of designed or pre-designed. And what happens is when we send them out in bulk, the Gmail takes it as a promotional email and puts it in spam folders or in the promotions for uh, tab. 
So kindly look out for them and just, just drag them along to the inbox and you should receive all the emails. We're hopefully going to do a lot more of these master classes in the, in the few months coming. Uh, we're hoping also to do a little more along the education route for uh, different groups. So kindly do uh, make sure that you're a part of our uh, community. Uh, thank you once again for being a part of today's meeting. And just a quick word from Dr. Govind as well, please. A round of applause to Dr. Vivek. He's put in a lot of effort and he's gone through a, a, a lot of effort and a lot of passion into it, I think. Uh, thank you, Vivek. It's been a good job done.